Testing? All right, excellent. Well, it's such a great pleasure to be here. I want to talk about something that we tackle uh, every single day. Uh, but before we get started, how many of us are programmers here? Great, I'm in the right place. Just want to make sure. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about something we do every single day. We, we write, write code, code to solve problems. problems. And, and uh, if, if you ask me one thing that really scares me the most, is the amount of complexity we quickly draw into our systems. So I'll first start by saying that when I was a kid, I used to tell a lot of scary stories. Now that I'm grown up, I just talk about programming. That is as scary, or if not more scary in general. And uh, when I, what I want to talk about today is, I've been writing code for a while, but I started being a consultant for software development for a while ago. And a few decades into it, what I want to do today is to simply share about stories of applications, code, companies that I've personally interacted with. And I've seen people struggle with complexity they draw in. And maybe how we can learn from that and how we can maybe avoid some of the problems that we have created as humans for ourselves in, in writing code. But again, you know, as Heraclitus once said, the only constant is change. Things are always changing. And our job is to really keep up with the change as time goes on. So the question is, how do we really keep up with this change? And uh, we all talk about agile development. So, but what is agile development? Agile development is, of course, is the ability for us to change. Well, that reminds me of one particular uh, experience. I was, um, one, of, one of my problems, uh, you know, generally is, it doesn't matter what I do, there's always a thread about programming and software development in the back of my mind. And I was having lunch with my children one day, and as we were having lunch, a little background thread, thinking about software development, I picked up my phone and I started typing a little tweet. And, and my children looked at what I was typing, and they immediately screamed saying, no dad, you're not supposed to say something like that. But of course, as a parent, those of you who are parents know this, one of your mission as a parent is always do things that embarrass your children. So I said, because they said don't, it's a time to really tweet it. So I tweeted it, and within minutes, that's probably one of my most impopular tweets ever. It started getting retweeted thousands of times to the shock of my children saying, my gosh, I cannot believe it. You tweeted something like this, and people are retweeting it. Well, here's the tweet I posted uh, a while ago when I was having lunch with my children. And, and I said this, that I've set a wedding date. I've not hashed her out yet how software projects are managed. So oftentimes, I find this really frustrating when people talk about agile development, but they already decided what the date for the release is. They decided the scope of development. They decided so many things, and then they tell you, oh, by the way, we are agile. Well, what does it really mean to be agile? Well, it turns out agile really is about being adaptive. And if we are not willing to be adaptive, we want to adapt the scope, we want to adapt the of functionalities we are implementing. We need to talk to the customers. We need to interact with them. And to be able to change, that becomes extremely important. So that aspect of change becomes really, really important. But what really makes it hard? And I'll say complexity makes it really hard to adapt to change. So you're sitting there talking to your customers, and you realize that you need to make some changes to your system in order for you to accommodate it. And then you realize, oh my goodness, but that change is going to be incredibly difficult. It's going to be really time consuming. It's going to be expensive. I don't think we want to make the change. So your ability to be agile goes down the more complex your software system is. And as it turns out, systems are capable and their capabilities are needed. Let's not be naive about it. The tax software you're developing is highly complex. The, uh, there's a lot of capabilities to it. The, uh, the reservation system you are building has domain-specific complexities into it. So we need to really work towards building this. So system design is complicated by nature. And, and the domain brings a lot of this, this into, into the play, and we have to deal with it. But unfortunately, though, we take a system that's complicated, but we often make it complex, and that makes it really hard. So sadly, we add complexity to what is already complicated. And I call this often the self-inflicted wound. 
So there are two kinds of complexities we need, need to deal with on a, every single day. The first complexity is, of course, the inherent complexity. The inherent complexity comes from the problem domain. Your banking applications or reservation system or tax software, whatever you, that you are building has complexities built into it from the domain, and the inherent complexity is what we want to deal with. Unfortunately, though, the software systems we built also bring what is called accidental complexity. An accidental complexity comes from the solution that we choose. And you often have multiple solutions, some of them less complex than others. And if we choose more complicated solutions, it becomes incredibly hard to maintain the system. So our job as programmers every day is to make the inherent complexity manageable, but eliminate or at least greatly reduce the accidental complexity. So we, like I said, we are the victims of the complexities ourselves. So what can we do to minimize this? So what I'm going to talk about right now is some examples of complexities I've personally seen. I'm sure you have seen probably more of those in your experience. And I want to just relate to things I've seen myself. And maybe if we can keep an eye for these things, we can help towards reducing the complexity, making things simple along the way. And that's what I want to focus on. So what really makes software system complex? I'll identify maybe about six or seven of those here today that I've seen personally. The first one I will talk about is too many moving parts in it. This is something I've noticed in several applications I've worked with, uh, too many moving parts. And when I talk about too many moving parts, more the moving parts are, the more complex the system really becomes. And, and you're thinking in the back of your mind, really, more complex, more moving parts, you're thinking microservices. Absolutely, microservices are disaster in a lot of companies because if you are using microservices when it is really not necessary, you brought in unnecessary complexity into the mix, and that's going to hurt us in the long run as well. So the complexity has to match with the needs of the software we're building. So clearly, I have complexity and microservices in the same sentence. Absolutely something to think about. But this reminds me of some experience I've seen in terms of very many moving parts. Well, Leslie Lamport once said, a distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. Well, that's the world we live in. You are getting an error, and you don't know why this error is causing because some system that you didn't even know exists is not behaving very well. Well, the more the moving parts it is, the harder it becomes to manage your systems as well that we are dealing with. But this reminds me of one experience about a client I worked with maybe about 15 years ago. And this company started out 10 years earlier to that, and their goal was to respond to their users. And they were extremely excited about making the systems work for their users. And they had some very prominent businesses that were using their application, and as a result, every time they would enter into a new contract with one of their major clients, they would implement customized code with it. And as a consultant, I got an opportunity to look at their code, and I have to tell you that I was absolutely shocked because the code literally had things like, if the customer is ABC, do this, if it's XYD, do this. And you can imagine the more customization you start doing, it, it's great in the beginning, but it begins to slow you down and the code becomes complex and complex and complex. Now, they really wanted to make sure their application can be customized for whatever customers they build it for. So I was talking to the developers and I was asking, what can you customize? And their answer is everything. And when they said everything, they were not kidding with you. You could customize everything. And their customization was implemented in code. Their customization was implemented in XML. And it was customization everywhere. It got to a point where when they have to deploy their application for one of their customers, they would need anywhere from six months to eight months to deploy it because you can configure the hell out of it. It was scary, to say the least, when I looked at it. But their configuration was XML, and everywhere it was XML. And this project really helped me to think a little bit deeper about XML. So here's my analysis about it. 
It is an XML, but it's, it's configuration XML is configuration from hell. And here's what I realized working on this particular project. That XML is like human. They're very cute when they are small, but they get really annoying when they get bigger. And this was extremely hard for them to maintain it. And this was almost impossible to really stay, stay sane while you are developing this application. And the more I worked with it, I realized that this is not for human. This is not human readable as much as people said it's read human readable, definitely not human writable. So this became extremely complex. And a lesson learned really is that while you want to be agile, while you want to meet your customer expectations, you got to really think about maintainability of your application. Sustainability really uh, comes in the form of developing an application where you can make it extensible, but not so customizable, so it becomes incredibly hard to customize and survive, and the complexities that come with it. So this application became extremely brutal. It was very error prone to develop. It was really hard to test. That's a really early warning sign. If it's really hard to test, you may want to think about it. It was very hard to reason with the code, but more so, it was incredibly hard to deploy it as well. So I often tell my developers, if you find things difficult when you're developing the application, it only gets worse during production. So this is an early warning sign for us, the programmers, to get a sense of it to say, how's it going? If I'm really finding it hard right now, this is going to blow up on our face when we go into production, early time to really fix it and get better at it. So that's one lesson I learned along the way. The next one I want to talk about is a series of invisible changes. I'm still bitter about it. A, a team contacted me and said, hey, Venkat, you know C++? I said, uh, absolutely, I know C++. I've programmed in C++ for about 15 years in production. I know the language really well. And then they said, you know, Scala. I said, yeah, absolutely, I know Scala. I've worked with it. I've written books on it. Absolutely. And then they said, we need some help with you from you. We got some C++ code and we need to port it over to Scala, can you help us with it? I should have said no, but I was very unwise. I said, sure, I'll be happy to help. Now I know better. And so they sent me the code. Now remember, I know C++ fairly well, and I start reading their code, and I never felt more stupid in my life, because I'm reading the code, and for the life of me, I cannot understand what the code was doing. And I was reading it again, and reading it again, and reading it again. And you know you're very desperate when you have to rely on a debugger to understand what a code is doing. So I put a breakpoint, and I'm stepping over a function. And the function is called get. And when I go over the function called get, an object just explodes in memory, being populated with data. And I'm like, I don't get it. Why would a get function populate a data all of a sudden? So now I'm stepping into the function. And this rabbit hole, you step into function, which only leads you to step into another function. I'm going deep and deep and deep to no relief. And I got extremely frustrated. And this is when I realized two truths in life, I think, we can agree upon. And I'm going to say there are two kinds of code that frustrate me the most. The one that makes me really angry. The first kind of code that frustrates me is the code one that wouldn't work? I'm like, why wouldn't this code work? And the second code that really frustrates me is the one that works, but shouldn't. And these things really, really bother me. And here is a piece of code that shouldn't work, but it does. And I'm staring at it. I'm like, why? Why does this code do what it's supposed to do? And that's when I realized what this team was doing. Deep down in a get function, they were making changes to objects that no sensible human will ever expect. I call this the concept of invisible changes. A lot of programmers do this without realizing it. You're reading through a function, you're casually setting context in your mind, and suddenly something happens and you don't expect it. And this is unfortunate because the one of the jobs of us as programmers is to make sure that the code conveys the intent. When a code conveys the intent, it's clear to understand. You anticipate what the code is going to do. You are looking forward to saying, yep, I expect this to happen. And suddenly the code does something wicked and wild, and you are surprised. And you spend 30 minutes to an hour 
trying to understand the code. And the problem is, six months later, you still don't remember it. And you repeat the same thing again, it's very expensive. So this is an invisible change I saw in the code. And so my recommendation is don't sneak around and change the state. I cannot tell you how many times I see this. I, I've seen this yesterday, I've seen it a week before, and I always go over to the programmers and say, can we get this intent clear, please? Within the function, you're sneaking around and doing something, but if you can take that as an explicit concept and represent it as a separate function, you are conveying to the programmer what you're doing and why you are doing it. And, and the most important question is, why? Why are we writing this code? And if we can't bring that out into a function, it becomes really hard to maintain it. So don't sneak around and make state changes, especially because that's very expensive. And this costs us time. And the more time we spend on the code, the less time we are able to spend on delivering quality to our customers. And these are self inflicted wounds we can really reduce in general. So the third thing I want to talk about is uncontrolled mutability. I've been programming for about 35 years now. And if you ask me, Venkat, tell me one thing you do different today than you did 25 years ago. Hands down, I'll tell you one thing very clearly I do today that I did very differently 20 plus years ago. And that is programming with fewer states. I can't tell you how many times I'm surprised by this. Given this is the way I wrote the code once, and now I see very differently, and I'm surprised when others still do this. I would sit down and start writing code with developers. I do a lot of prepared programming. And when I sit down, somebody would say, let's start writing a field. They write a class, private something, and they put a field. I say, whoa, whoa wait a minute, why'd you write this field? And they look very surprised and say, what do you mean? We need this field. Like, we don't. You don't want to, I don't write my fields, period. I start writing my functions, methods, and only when the method demands that it needs a field, I make the field cry and plead for its existence. And then reluctantly, I bring a field into my class because it's easy and cheap to bring in fields, very expensive to remove them. I was working with a client recently, and they are on a big data project. They want to make their code parallel so they can improve the performance. And as, as we were working on it, we were trying to you know, introduce parallelism and run things faster. I walk into work at 7 in the morning. We start early. And as I walked in, my colleague was already at work. He looked at me and said, Venkat, I made this code parallel. And he paused, and I said, and? And he said, the code really ran really, really fast and gave me the wrong results. And, and I said, great, what you have is one variable which is being mutated, and your job is to find that variable. He just laughed at me, at me and said, are you serious? You don't even know anything about our system. You're a consultant, and you think you have the answer already. I said, look, I'm not a magician. I have a gut feeling, and your job today working with me is to find that variable. This was, by the way, 7 a.m., at 3 p.m., his, his cursor is you know, blinking on a field, and he's looking at me and saying, I, I hate it when you are right. It's that field that caused the problem. The rest of the afternoon was to refactor the code to remove that mutability from the code. So mutability is expensive to maintain in the long run. It's easy to bring mutability, but it costs you every single day. I'm going to go to the extent to say that mutability needs company. It often hangs around with bugs. So the more mutability we have in code, the more bugs we have in code as well, and it becomes really, really hard to maintain it. So if there's one thing I've learned over the past few decades is to work really hard to reduce the amount of mutability I have in code. In fact, this becomes even worse, and I'm going to go to the extent to say that state transitioning causes brain damage. So the more you do in code, the harder it is. And, and generally, though, you know, this is one thing about programmers, right? We, uh, programmers have different names in the world. We are called weird, right? Sometimes people say, you're weird. Um, I have an optometrist, and she was examining my eyes, and she asked me, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a programmer. And about 15 minutes later, as she was examining my eyes, she said, oh, by the way, Venkat, what do you do for a living? 
I said, I'm a programmer, but I already told you this a few minutes ago. And she said, yes, I heard you, but I just wanted to make sure that you really said that because you, you look almost normal. I don't know what that means, actually, almost normal. And we have this connotation that programmers are weird. Well, that I know why programmers are weird. We're not weird. We're not socially uh, you know, misaligned. I always say that programmers are very social with the right kind of people, right? Uh, if you ever catch me in an airplane, on a 10-hour airplane, I'll be the quietest person in the world. I usually take a window seat, I just sit there, I open my laptop as soon as I sit down, and I want to keep coding. I have no interest in talking to the person next to me until I find out that the person next to me is a programmer. It changes everything now. We got anywhere from garbage collection to memory leaks to talk about. It'll be a riot for the rest of the airplane. So, so we got a lot of things to think about on our head, and that is something we do. But one of the problems we often deal with is, as programmers, the reason we look a lot weird is, we got to comprehend all this complexity into our minds. So we have built all this in our mind. So here's a typical day of our life, isn't it? You're sitting and writing code, you're staring at your code, but what people don't realize is, you have made all that connection of your algorithm and your objects and data structure in your mind. And at this very moment, you're just connecting this object to this other object. You're saying, I've got a reference to this object. I need to initialize it with it. And when I do it, it's going to work. And right at that moment, somebody asks you, did you have lunch? And you're just staring at them. You're not answering them, right? You're looking at them. And they're, they're saying, I'm sorry, did you have lunch? And, and you're still staring at them. And they say, you're weird. And they walk away. And then you realize, by asking you that stupid question, have you had lunch, they completely disrupted this model. And everything was on the floor. And now you're trying to put this back together so you can start getting back to work. And 20 minutes later, you're like, I know what I was doing. And you're about to connect that link again. And somebody says, would you like some coffee? You're like, I'm done with it, right? And, and this is something programmers understand. You could be pairing with somebody, that's great. But somebody who's not part of your pairing asked you some question and you feel absolutely angry because they disrupted your thought. Well, in my experience, I've been married for a while now and my wife, she thought she was marrying me, but eventually she understood she married a programmer. And I can only imagine how difficult life is for a person who's not a programmer to be married to a programmer. And people in this room probably you know, begin to realize it. When I, when I was married, uh, you know, I, I enjoy writing code, but I enjoy spending time with her as well. But it's very often I would tell her, I want to go out to shopping with you, but let me get this done in five minutes. Well, there was one day I told her I'll be done in five minutes. And then she said, sure, I'll wait. And then she picked up the keys and she went out. And then eventually she came back and I finished my work and I looked at her and said, I'm really disappointed. I told you I'll be finished in five minutes. I said, I'll join you, but you decided to leave. And she came close to me, put her hands on my shoulder and said, Venkat, listen up. I'm going to tell this once to you and you better listen very carefully. And I said, yes, ma'am, what is it? And she said, you need to understand something you don't know, but I'll let you know this secret on you. When you tell me it's five minutes, it's usually seven hours. And that's when I realized Programmers have a different perception of time. You know, how many times have you told this to your boss? How's it going? I'll, almost done. And three months later, we're still fixing one more bug, I'll be done. We have a different perception of time than the rest of the humans in the world. And now I'm a lot more sympathetic to her. So when I say I'm done in five minutes, she smiles at me and says, I'm sure you'll be done. And then she goes on doing her life, uh, going about her life. Well, that's the problem with us, the programmers, is we have a very different perception of time. But what really made this easy for us is the best money I ever spent in my life was when I went to watch this movie called Social Network. And I was watching the movie with my wife. We're in a movie theater, and I was sitting next to her in the back of the theater, as we usually do. And suddenly, she screamed out in the middle of the movie and said, oh my gosh, I get it. And I'm like, take my money, most precious money ever you could spend. And here's the scene where she screamed out, let me play this for you. So here's the scene when Sean Parker walks in, let's see what happens. I didn't know we had a doorbell. Andrew, get the door! No, he's wired in. He's wired in. I've been in. cutting security deposit. 
Andrew. Not now. Good boy. I'm Sean Parker. Oh, he's wired in. That's what I'm talking about. He's wired in. The minute that scene came out, my wife screamed out and I said, oh my gosh, I get it. And I said, what is it? And she said, you're not weird. You're wired. And I am like, where was this movie all this time? And a few weeks later, I was at home in the kitchen, working away. One of my kids came and said, Dad, I have a question. And my wife said, no, don't talk to Dad right now. He's wired. I'm like, yes. And this is the beauty of our life is when the family understands, happiness is when the world understands programmers. So all this complexity that we have to build in our head and being wired, and this metaphor has helped us so much now because every time at, at work, at home, at work, the word is, hey, he's wired right now, don't bother him. And I always tell people, you are most welcome to talk to me when I'm coding. Just don't expect me to listen. And, and the point really is that it takes such a focus for us to really get our work done because of the complexities we have to deal with every single day. So my recommendation is work a little extra hard to reduce mutability in code because reducing mutability reduces complexity. Reducing complexity reduces the time and cost of maintaining system. That's one way we can you know, make things better. It's well worth the effort. Another thing that I've seen over time is lack of cohesion. Cohesion is where like things are together and unlike things are apart. But the question is why? Why should we reduce uh, to, to increase cohesion? Why should we focus on that? The reason is it reduces in general the frequency of change that a code needs to go through. So when a code is narrow and focused and does one thing well, it reduces the frequency of change of the code and that reduces the cost of changing the code in general. So we want to really be able to modularize the code as much as we can, and we want to be able to deal with it. But then, one thing we all deal with every single day is what I would like to call as excessive dependencies. We deal with dependency every single day. But unfortunately though, dependencies are cheap to bring in but expensive to take out. And I am that person on the software teams, the annoying person on the teams, who constantly is asking, do we need that? Do we need that? Do we need that? Because what I've realized over time is, it is less expensive to bring in, extremely expensive to take out. So how can we minimize our dependencies? And I just realized that I've spent my career going from one dependency hell to another. So I just wanted to reflect on my career. I've had a one hell of a programming career from DLL hell to jar hell to assembly hell to NPM hell, what next? Oh, talking about these different hell, that reminds me of one experience. I was on a flight and the captain just announced, uh, folks, we have a smooth ride, we are at a cruising altitude, I'm gonna turn off the seat belt, and just within a couple of minutes, I opened my laptop, I wanted to write some code, and all I did honestly, genuinely with no ill intention, I just typed NPM install, turbulence immediately. I had to shut down my computer, put it back, and apologize to people near me, I'm really sorry I did this. Never open uh, NPM after that on flights. This can be really, really hard in general. But the question is, what is next? And we are dealing with module hell in Java right now. There are other things we can be looking at along the way. So there's a lot of stuff we need to really think about in terms of the complexities that come from dependencies. But of course, we all manage dependencies in different ways. But the other day I was asking people, I was working with a team who, which was developing code in JavaScript. And I was sitting with this developer and the developer said, hey, we quit running some test cases because we upgraded our dependencies and some of the tests broke and we don't have time to fix it, so we stopped running those test cases. I said, oh, that's really sad. You had these test cases, you're not running them right now because you upgraded dependencies. And then I said, wait a minute, how many dependencies did you, do you have? And he answered without any emotion. That's what really bothered me. He looked at me and said, how many dependencies? Oh, we have about 150 dependencies. I said, 150? And he realized I didn't believe him. He opens the file and shows me the dependencies. 
more than 150 dependencies. And I looked at him and said, I know what your application is doing. Why do you need 150 dependencies for it? What I really liked about, about him is he's honest, you know, he was honest in giving his answer. So I asked him, why do you have so many dependencies? And he said, because we found them. And that is the truth, isn't it? You are having lunch with your team and you are in a restaurant and as you are ha having a good time talking to your team, in the neighboring uh, table, there's a group of programmers from another company and your eyes kind of extend, you're listening to what they are talking about. And suddenly they mention a different JavaScript framework and a library or a package. And you talk to your team and say, have you used that package? And they all very sadly say no. And three hours later, it's integrated into production, isn't it? Because how could you not use this library that others are talking about? We are living in this phase of infatuation to drag in dependencies. Uh, the other day I was asking somebody, how do you manage it? And one person said, well, we are in a Java project. We never have this problem, he said. I was curious, said, really? You're doing a Java project, you have no problem. How do you deal with the dependency? And he said, well, we use Maven. I had to tell him the bad news. Uh, you don't use Maven, it uses you. So you get dragged into the dependencies, it beats you down, and you have to deal with it. This is not the problem of Maven, by the way. It's a problem of us bringing in dependencies, and they become obsolete, they become hard to maintain, and dependencies in general cost us more in the long run than we realize it, so be extremely careful bringing dependencies in. So dependencies are really hard to maintain. They become obsolete over time and become incompatible. In, in all the uh, you know, com uh, companies I've been working with, the ones that are able to upgrade to new versions of Java are the ones with fewer dependencies. The one with more dependencies often take more time to upgrade because the slowest changing one is the one that decides your pace of ev evolution that becomes really hard. But this really leads to what I like to call as technology infatuation. Technology infatuation is dangerous. And I often say, if the things you learn are the things you use, you are in trouble. I want to learn about more things than I would use in production. I would have, want to have 10 times more or 100 times more that I want to learn, but I have, want to put a fewer things in production. I need to separate those two things uh, out. I need to understand technology, I need to prototype, I need to play with them. But whether it applies to my product is a lot more difficult to decide and it shouldn't be done by infatuation. It reminds me of one client experience. I was talking to this programmer and he leaned over to me and said, I have a favor to ask you, Venkat. I said, what can I do for you? Uh, and, he, and he said, here's the technology we're using. And I told him, I don't see why you need this technology. I understand your product. Here's a simpler one to use. That's going to be more expensive for you to use. And he leaned over to me and said, I got a favor to ask you. Can you make sure you don't come and talk to my boss about it? And I said, why not? And he said, because we convinced my boss we cannot build without it. And I don't want him to know that we can actually build it without this technology. Well, unfortunately, that's a problem. And so the question we want to ask is, is this the right choice? Does this help the product, not me as a programmer to learn it, but is it really helping the product with provide value to the users. We want to think about things like reversibility. Reversibility is a property by which we can decide how hard or easy it is to back out of a design decision we make or an architectural decision you make. If this is not the right direction to go, how expensive it is to revert back from it. And it's the ability to really make those decisions go away and move in a different direction. And in that regard, I want you to think about libraries and frameworks. Libraries and frameworks, if you ask me, which of those keeps me awake in the night? Honestly, the one that keeps me awake in the night are the framework. Frameworks, so libraries are the things that you use. Frameworks grow around your code and they lock you in. And once you commit to a framework, it's expensive to get out of it. And if you ask me to choose something, I will choose a library relatively quickly. But if you ask me to choose a framework, I need to do more work before I commit to a framework because that's expensive. 
So the libraries, uh, the use of a library is easier to reverse than to reverse out framework. Uh, in, using a really silly analogy, I would say, if you want to compare libraries to framework, I would say using a library is like dating. Using a framework is like entering into marriage. You don't want to do that too easily. It can be really expensive and very hurtful to reverse out of it. So take your time to deliberate and ask the question, before you make a decision, ask the question, how reversible is my decision? If my decision is hard to reverse, you want to spend more time making the decision. If your decision is easier to reverse, you can be a little light in making the decision. And that really comes back to impact our ability to deliver software and to be agile as well. That makes a big difference. But this reminds me of the times when I was a young programmer. And I'm, I know this is kind of a bit scary because this always puzzles my children. They often look at me and say, I don't understand that. What do you mean you lived once when there was no Google? And it's hard for them to know that I lived when there was no Google. I lived when there were no cell phones. And then they would ask me, how do you escape those dinosaurs, Dad? Well, sure, we lived in a time when we didn't have the technologies we have today. And I personally spent my youth as a programmer using these stuff. Uh, probably what you have seen in a museum, but that's what we used to do to install software. So when I wanted to really you know, use a dependency, we would order the software, wait for months maybe, and then eventually one day it'll arrive by mail. And you have this tape and you take the tape to the tape drive and you install it and you install the software. When there was a tape drive between you and the software you want to use, you didn't bring dependencies so quickly. Today, they are a download away. You click it and you get integrated. Dangerous times to live in. Which means we need to use a lot more restraint in bringing dependencies in. If we don't, what happens? We increase the complexity of systems we develop, and there's a name for this, by the way. It's called the resume-driven development. This is a dangerous reason to use applications. A lot of people use uh, technology so they can put that on their resume. This is not, I, when I look at a resume, it's got 200 things on it. I will never hire that person. Because what that means is they're going to come and complicate my system in production. I can release my product. So there's, I want a resume that talks about what have I used in production, what are the things I've learned. Now we are talking. If the learned list is bigger than what you use in production, I'm keenly interested in talking to the person. Because the person has the thirst to learn and the wisdom not to use it. And, and that is exactly what I'm looking for in people, is your ability to learn and the wisdom to restrain from using things that are not relevant for your application. So again, to reiterate, you need to learn a lot more than what you put in production. That's really important for a professional to use. That becomes very critical. This brings up a point about, uh, a point about uh, uh, one experience I would never forget. Uh, this was back in 2004, a time when US economy was in recession. I was happy that I was a consultant working for a company. And we interviewed somebody, we were desperate to hire somebody. We interviewed somebody who was amazing. So the person I was reporting to, the VP of R&D, came to me and said, what do you think of this person? I said, don't waste your time talking to me. Amazing person, hire him now. Yeah, 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 but that's good. What do you think of the framework he's been developing? Amazing framework, don't waste your time, hire him now, quickly. I am really, really eager to work with him. I'm a little selfish, I wanna learn from him. I think he's amazing, bring him on board. We will use his service, we'll build this application, we'll get better. And, and, and the VP said, yeah, yeah, that's great, but one more question. What do you think of us using the framework he is building? I said, please sit down, let's talk about it. I said, please don't do this. We got a six-month schedule, let's focus on releasing the product. Do not commit to his framework. But Venkat, did you see his framework? It's got distributed, fault-tolerant messaging. I said, listen. You never use those words in a sentence ever before with me. But, but, but you gotta have a vision. Isn't that cool we can use it? I said, listen, your eyes are dilated. Don't do this right now. Please tell him you wanna hire him. Don't talk about the framework. A week goes by, remember this clearly, Wednesday afternoon, two o'clock, I'm sitting and coding. He comes and sits on my desk and he says, Venkat. I said, yep. 
I've got a good news for you. And what is it? Well, we have extended the offer, and he's agreed to come and work with us. I said, I cannot tell you how happy I am. It's going to be great. We're going to do amazing. We're going to release this product. We got a right help. I can't tell you how happy I am. You made my day. Oh, by the way, no. Oh, by the way, as part of this hiring, I, we agreed, signed a contract to use this framework. I said, please tell me, please tell me you're just joking to make me angry. No, it's done, it's committed. I said, well, that's great. Just now that you confirmed it, you just received my resignation, I'm done, I'm leaving. Oh, I told my boss already you're going to say this. Hey, at least I'm predictable, I'm glad. If there's any other work, let me know. I packed my stuff, went home. This is one of the few rare days I'm actually home, really, when the light is still out, uh, uh, on. I go home, my wife is like, oh my gosh, you're home early today. Well, I quit. And she said, what do you mean you quit? I said, that means I don't have a job. She said, actually, you do. There's work in the kitchen if you can take care of it. And we just moved on. And I found another gig and moved on. 18 months later, 18 months later, I, my phone rings. I pick the phone and I hear him. I said, hello. Hey, Venkat. Hey, long time. How is it going? Go ahead and say it. I said, what do you mean? Go ahead and say it. Go ahead and say it. I told you so. Oh my gosh, what happened? In the 18 months, they put more code into the framework, which they didn't need. And now they've not released their product. This company failed because they were infatuated to use a framework that they never had a need for in the first place. And I can go into more details about it, but at the end of the day, what makes me sad is when people are infatuated about technology and lose focus on what they are building and why they are building it. So my recommendation is don't build what you can download and don't download what you don't really need. So apply that you know, resistance, uh, resili uh, be, be very sensitive to ask the question, what is the long-term cost of what I bring in? And, and do an econ economic analysis, not just a technology analysis in making your decision. Now, a few more things I want to talk about, things I've seen. Uh, accidental complexity, and I would say low-level concurrency is one of them. Let's take a look at an example here, if you will. So here in this code, just to quickly take a look at it, I've got a Boolean variable right here called done. And I said done to false, as you can see here. Then I have a thread I created. I say running, uh, printing the word running, uh, count is zero. While not down, I keep incrementing the count. And of course, at the end of this, if it gets out of the loop, I print out exiting the thread. And I started the thread. And in the main, I sleep for two seconds. After two seconds, I'm setting the done to true. So when the done is set to true, I expect this while loop to end. So that is the code I have right here. Now I'm going to take this code right there. Let's save that away. Let's go ahead and run that code if you don't mind and see what it is going to do. And as you can see, it's running. It started the thread. And two seconds later, it said, setting done to true. But notice, after setting done to true was called, it never printed exiting the thread. Maybe I can give it a little bit more time. What do you think? Well, it turns out this program is never going to end. Well, but then I love asking these kinds of questions to programmers. If you go back to this code and add this one little thing, if you say thread uh, dot sleep, and I'm going to simply say zero, right? Which means I'm not even sleeping, if you will. And then I say exception uh, EX and write that code. And so literally I added a sleep of zero. That's all I did. So it's not technically taking any time to sleep uh, in, in this case. But when I go back and run that code right now, what you notice here is that the program actually quit. So the question really is, what's going on? As it turns out, concurrency is extremely hard to get right. For us to understand how concurrency actually works, we have to understand the Java memory model. Most programmers who program concurrency haven't understood the Java memory model. I used to go around the world telling people that I think it is very difficult to get concurrency correct. I think it's very difficult to get concurrency correct. But that was before I read Brian Getz's book called Java Concurrency in Practice. After I read this book, I know it is not possible to get concurrency correct because it is that complex. And for us to get this right, everything has to be right. So Java memory model plays a very important role 
And I consider this to be accidental complexity we bring into code. I've seen companies fail at their products because they jumped into concurrency too early and did that very poorly. So we, we look at a problem and say, I've got to solve this problem using a pool of threads. Now we have a pool of problems to deal with. And it becomes really, really hard for us to manage the product. It becomes very expensive in the long run. So I would attribute concurrency to another one of those accidental complexities we often deal with. And of course, a skill we need to develop as programmers is the ability to discern accidental complexity from inherent complexity. If we develop that skill to recognize that is accidental complexity, that is inherent, reduce this and make that manageable, then we have a big win in what we do. And that is our job as programmers to constantly look at it. A few other things we want to think about quite often is that imperative style of programming has more accidental complexity. It's packed with more of those and makes code more expensive in the long run. One of the reasons I enjoy functional programming in general is because it's declarative in nature. And I want to really reduce the complexity by doing so. But the last thing I want to talk about is a concept which I've seen in several places. It's called entwinement. Entwinement really is when you bring completely independent concepts, but you put them together where they don't belong. Every one of us falls into this trap. Not only do we fall into trap, even the best of the minds, if you don't mind thinking about it, falls into this trap quite a bit in what we have seen over time, and that's what really makes it really hard, if you will. So here is an example. I have a class called resource, and the resource constructor says create it. Op1 and Op2 are just functions, but I have a finalize method right there. And the finalize says cleaning up non-memory resource, external resource like a file or a socket or a remote service as a database. So what I want to do here is to create a resource, if you will, and I say resource, e uh, resource uh, is equal to new resource, we'll create an object, call resource.op1 and call resource.op2. But unfortunately, though, when I run this code, what you're going to notice is it says created op1, op2, but notice it never called the finalize method. Why is that? The reason is in Java, the garbage collection is like garbage collection in my neighborhood. It doesn't matter I put the garbage out. They don't care to take it. It's automated, but it's not deterministic. It's automated, but it's not instantaneous. So as a result, in this particular case, your memory management is taken care of by the JVM, but what about external resources? It took them a long time to realize this. And this is a problem of entwinement. What they did without realizing is they mixed garbage collection, which is managing memory, with managing external resources. Now, as you know, starting Java 9, finalize has been deprecated. Why did they deprecate finalize method? Because they realized entwinement is wrong. And we all make this mistake every day. If you ask me, Venkat, have you ever entwined things in your code? You just describe my life as a programmer. That's what I'm untangling every day when I work with my code, with my client's code. I keep reminding ourselves, those two things don't mix together. Separate them, separation of concern. This is Java finally realizing separation of concern is needed. That's why you have try with resources now to manage external dependency separate from finalize. You don't want to use finalize. So this problem is so common that Rich Hickey pointed this out. He just coined a new term for it. He calls it complexing. He says complexing things, he says, is the source of complexity. So one of the things I want you to watch out for is complexing. Watch out for entwinement. And every single day, when I review my own code, when I review my client's code, when I review my colleague's code, I look for this entwinement. Did we bring two concepts that don't belong together, but we put them together because it's convenient? That convenience costs us a lot of money in the long run. So take the time to identify entwinement and separate them out. 
And, and Java is a great example of entwinement. There are more examples of entwinement in Java than the finalized method I showed you. But that is not to say that they were wrong. It is to show that it's a hard problem. We all get trapped as humans in it. They are no exceptions. We are more culpable than them to really get into that. Look out for entwinement in the code. So we talked about several things here. Too many moving parts, invisible changes, uncontrolled mutable lack of cohesion, excessive dependencies you have to deal with, being infatuated with technology, low-level concurrency, using imperative style, and you know, dealing with entwinement. We talked about a lot of these things that I've seen personally that leads to more complexity in code. I'm sure you may have a bigger list of things you may have seen in your experience. Add them to the list. This can be a nice thing to review in your teams so we can work towards reducing complexity and we can make move towards simplicity. And by doing so, we can reduce the amount of time and effort we need to develop these products. But why is it worth doing so? I would say we should learn to deal with complexity and have the wisdom to minimize complexity. This should be our job every single day. And, and a good programmer has the wisdom to identify complexity and puts the effort to minimize it. And, and if we can do that every single day, we are able to create applications that are more main, maintainable, applications that are simpler, applications that can provide value to our customers, and we can actually go home maybe on time and not have to spend too much time on this code. So I'll end by saying a maintainable code is a gift we give ourselves for the future. And that probably is the best gift we can give ourselves is a maintainable code. Hope this was useful. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank God. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very, very much for that insightful talk. And uh, what a great way to start the day. I, I, I had some questions earlier on, but I was, as I was, I was, I was listening you. to you, the big challenge, of course, is, you know, putting in dependencies or using dependencies and being challenged by your manager to say, you know, use the thing as fast as possible because we need to push this. But you always have to kind of that politics, right? What do we use? What don't we use? But uh, thank you very much for that. Thank you. All right, folks. Um, I'm sorry we were late. Maria and I will be facilitating for you today. Um, but uh, I, as as Venkat was opening up uh, opening up his his command line over there and uh, and uh, his his code editor, I, I could just sense Maria's heart rate kind of rising, right? Because yeah, we are weird people. We program as weird and wired, but apparently coding is hot, right? Apparently coding is sexy. Uh, whenever I open up the command prompt or the or the uh, the code editor, she's like, "My God, that's hot!" All those those colorful lines and stuff. So you know, I haven't I haven't started pair programming with her yet, but I think that could be an interesting challenge. Uh, but uh, but a lot of what you said resonated. Does anybody have any questions for for Vankat? Because we have a few minutes. If not, we will chase you off for coffee, and uh, we'll be back. Oh, we have a question. question we have a question in the back. Where is it? Raise your hand. There you go. Hi. Uh, about the, the first uh, thing you said about too many moving parts, you mentioned about microservices, but in uh, a lighter constant modules. Okay. We have Maven and module, a project with modules. If we organize the project with modules as a statement, we do this. We have the first thing we have is the separation, uh, uh, not having to lose the capital code. Okay. So is this is a better first idea to keep, and then other things. It may be a bit different what you said, but yeah. Th th like thanks it. for the question. Um, so, so the the problem is this. Um, we want, we have the desire to generalize solutions. And, and that's a good, good desire to have. But m what my experience has shown is, the more I make prescriptive solutions to the world, the more I'm misleading them. So my utmost sincere answer to you is the one that we all have been trained to give, which is, it depends. So I really think there's a reason why we say it depends. Not because we don't want to answer a question, because context really matters. So my answer to your question is, it depends on the context. Um, it has to be evaluated based on what we're trying to do. The problem we deal with is not a choice we make, but the way we evaluate trade-offs. Trade-offs rule us. 
So if I make things more reusable, which is great in our opinion, but increases the coupling. If I reduce coupling, I often reduce reuse as well. So the problem really is not a choice we make, but the balancing we do. So the answer to your question is, we have to evaluate, and there are times I would choose one approach, there are times I may choose another approach. My goal is not to use the same approach. My goal is to provide value to the product I'm developing and make it maintainable. So the answer to your question, unfortunately, is context matters. And I, I normally don't answer that question uh, as a prescription until I get an opportunity to evaluate the situation, and then we can make a decision for it. That, but that's the reason for it. We have to evaluate the trade-off. I'll take one more. I'll take one more if we have it. There we go. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. I would like to ask, are there any do you have any resources that you can share about complexity, reducing complexity maybe, or, or figuring out complexity, basically? Yes, so thank you for the question. Uh, so what are the resources to uh, reduce the complexity? Um, the, the first, uh, well, there are several talks on, on YouTube. I mentioned Rich Hickey here. He has got a fantastic talk on uh, simple, not easy. Uh, we can learn from all of those things. Um, but my honest answer to you, more than resources, is I, I'll chime in the words of uh, Newton. Uh, Newton say, said, I see the farthest because I stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, if you ask me personally, one thing that's helped me the most immensely is being critiqued, being critiqued by my colleagues. So my, my best resource is to really be shameless. I'm absolutely shameless. I write really, really nasty code, and I go to my colleagues and say, I'm stupid, tell me how I can, I can make this better. And, 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 and this is one of the things I am I'm absolutely surprised about. I cannot write good quality code, but I'm extremely good in finding fault with other people's code. And so I decided it's a great way to leverage. I write really crappy code, give it to somebody else, while they improve my code, I improve their code. So to me, the best resource has been my friends and colleagues. I write something, I have them critique it, we debate about it, and we ask the question, how do you, what do you, how do you, the, the word, how does this feel? I know that's not very scientific, but one of the most important questions, I put some code in front of people and ask them the question, how does it feel? Does it feel like it's complex? Does it feel like it's simple? And that becomes a good starting point for, our, for us to discuss and then we evolve the code. So biggest resource has been the criticism of my colleagues, if you will. Thank you, Venkat. That's the kind of code I write too. I write really shitty code. I'm probably going to put that on my CV and get a job, I guess, today. <laughs> I, hope, I hope so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Venkat. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. All right, we have a quick, we have a quick coffee break.